podcast is titled New Research, How to Take AI-Assisted B2B Content Marketing from Creation to Conversion. My name is Kelly Lindenau, and I'm the Senior Managing Editor of Demand Gen Report, and I'll also be your moderator for this presentation. I am so excited you all joined us today, but before we get to the good stuff, I'm going to take a few moments to go through a few housekeeping slides. Today's uh, presentation is featuring VIB. Uh, VIB is the go-to B2B demand generation partner for B2B marketers and salespeople in high tech. Uh, they connect tech decision makers with the solution providers through the VIB community. That win-win approach helps them find the best leads who are accurately segmented and most importantly, qualified. And to walk us through our presentation today, we have two B2B marketing experts on hand. We have Mariah West and Katie DiMatteo. Um, so, I mean, you definitely got into it a bit in the bio. I've been working in marketing for almost 10 years, uh, working a variety of industries. Um, specifically recently, I've been consulting for, um, a lot of different companies, some in sort of like the ad tech AI space. So when I think about, uh, generative AI and AI writing and that sort of thing. It's been very top of mind for me recently, um, especially as I have been working with companies that are really starting to dig into using that for top of funnel content creation. All right, let's hear a little bit more from you. Tell us about why generative AI is important to you. Yeah, sure. So, hey, everybody, I'm Mariah West. As Kelly said, um, I've been in B2B marketing for quite a while, a little over 15 years. And in my case, I've also, similar to Katie, had a wonderful pleasure of working with a lot of amazing teams and some really cool software companies from small to large. And now I'm VP of marketing at VIB. Um, and as you heard a little bit, we're a demand generation partner that basically helps technology companies in that all important task of generating leads and finding new customers. So not only am I a marketer myself, but at VIB, our buyer is primarily marketers. So we get exposed to a lot of conversations on new challenges and techniques. And one that's been coming up a lot lately is our topic for today, generative AI. So in prep for the session, what we did was we actually surveyed around 350 of our customers on the marketing trends around AI adoption. And I wanted to take this opportunity to bring some of those results. Um, just so that you can get a sense for how a larger pool of peers are thinking about the topic, as well as hear from myself and Katie too. So as far as my own experience with um, generative AI, there are a lot of applications of AI, but I think as we like dive into the discussion, it might be important first to just like define generative AI um, because there's a lot of different kinds of AI. Generative specifically is where the output is creation of content of some form. So I think for B2B marketers, we think of that in the form of like actual text-based content. But from what I've seen, it could also be things like images or audio or simulations. And for me, the promise of generative AI is pretty amazing. I think about how many times I have to iterate on copy, or maybe I've like hit a roadblock on ideas, or I'm writing about something pretty commonplace. Right now, what I do is I either look through my library of pre-existing material to riff off of it, or how many of you are like me and you go to search engines to find similar examples just to get the process started. So instead, to be able to prompt an AI tool to do that initial output, something that can be edited, something that can potentially be a huge time saver and again, inefficiency. And um, from our survey, it also sounds like I'm not alone. In our survey, 84% of marketers, they feel pretty good about generative AI making either some or a strong positive impact in the next 12 months. And more specifically, 96% think that it's gonna have a positive impact on that domain around content marketing. Um, and it's worth mentioning too that in the survey, we noticed a shift of perception of how we're thinking about our use of AI when ChatGDP became mainstream. So before ChatGDP, most of us were using traditional marketing automation and chatbots. Those were kind of our primary AI use cases. In addition to that, there was kind of like a smattering of maybe you were using predictive analytics or personalization engines. But post-ChatGDP, 
most of us are using AI for the power of copywriting, um, either with chat GDP itself or one of the other highly ranked things was Grammarly as far as highest in adoption or testing. So it's no wonder that that promise um, to impact to content is so high. So from my perspective, there's a lot of ways to go with this conversation. Perfect. So let's just kick things off here. And uh, my first question for you guys is, how do you see AI generated ideation or content fitting into your larger strategy moving forward? Again, Katie, I'm gonna pick on you first. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that there's so much that can be done with AI generated content um, specifically, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, with you know top of funnel uh higher level marketing materials right so social posts emails um even you know some short form blog content i've seen some really really incredible thought leadership blogs that have come out of uh chat gpt um and it's it's there's there's so much that is there but at the same time i think that my i have seen that it takes it takes a lot of work, even working with uh, a platform like a generative AI platform to get it to the place that you want it to be. So I think that like the biggest thing that I want to caution against is just assuming that you can put something in and use whatever that output is. It's still going to be a back and forth. There is still going to be an iteration process there. However, it will take some of the legwork away. It will allow you to work differently maybe not less, but it gives you a different avenue for content creation that I think is really exciting. All right, awesome. And uh, Mariah, do you have any thoughts on that? I would totally agree with Katie. It takes a lot of iteration on top of the content. Um, so from our perspective, we're still very much in the investigation phase. And some of the ways that it might be easy for me to kind of explain where we're fitting it into our strategy is First, maybe explaining like where we aren't planning on testing it. Um, for us at this moment in time, digital content for the purpose of SEO, you know, we all know that search doesn't love AI generated anything really. So it's kind of only a matter of time before the algorithms catch up and disregard that type of content altogether. So we're not using it for that. We also don't currently have a plan to use it for what I'll call like high value content. Um, and the way to describe that is um, things where we want to kind of bring a new or unique perspective to something. Mostly, uh, most, most of the reason why we don't want to use a generative AI for that is because the data that AI uses to generate content is generally being pulled from everything that already exists, right? Um, and I think I even saw some stats on like 2021 and before. So the output of the content that it generates becomes a little bit more like a regurgitation of existing ideas. Um, and sometimes because of that, it can also come across a little prescriptive. So I think the tone, the wit, the creativity, in addition to just like bringing novel ideas, it all still requires a human touch. So we're not using it in those two areas, but where we are testing it, testing it, excuse me, is um, in what I would call like iterative content, where basically we're inputting something that we already wrote and asking for different versions of it. Um, and most of the situations, that's for things that are not editorial, but more like go-to-market oriented, like formulaic things like a promotion or product update, or maybe like something that we've written that we now wanna have short copy blocks for, for email or social. Um, but as far as how that fits into the entire strategy moving forward, for us, the jury's kind of still out a little bit, but I do also wanna show the results from the survey as well. Um, most of our customers kind of felt expressed that they felt the same. Um, as far as how generative AI loops into the larger strategy, 38% have a clear plan to adopt generative AI in the next 12 months or less. And 45% are still kind of figuring it out. So they're either testing or they're considering without any particular formal plans. We also ask this same question in the framework of spend. And around half said that they don't plan or are not sure how AI will intersect with their budget. So some of that could have to do with the fact that a lot of the new AI tools like chat GPT and BARD, they're free to us for now, 
But there are still folks who have dedicated spend earmarked for AI-centric tools, which is pretty interesting. Now, what was most interesting to me in the realm of this question on the potential in relation to a larger strategy, though, was the variety of answers on how people see them self-supplying it to the different areas. We, of course, saw a concentration on creating assets and personalizing content. But interestingly enough, a lot of folks said they see potential in it creating their marketing strategy. Um, I need to do a little bit of digging on what they mean by this, but I guess in theory, if you put all your inputs in on your strategy, it could turn it into a nice buttoned up plan. Um, I don't know, as well as some interesting kind of perceived opportunities for use in analytics use cases, customer retention use cases, even kind of promotion itself. So I'm not exactly sure how that would work, but it's certainly an interesting idea and kind of expresses that a lot of us are viewing generative AI as having a variety of applications and the different things that we do. All right, perfect. So then with that in mind, how do you think that marketing teams can use AI to personalize messaging for different audiences? And Mariah, I'm gonna start with you this time. So when I think about personalization and the use of AI, if we think of AI tools as not something that's gonna necessarily produce all the content for us, but instead kind of help us organize or maximize existing work, then personalization is definitely a great use case. And I'm not talking about you know variables or tokenization. I mean personalization to a specific audience segment or persona. So for example, you know, let's say you took the time to write a piece of content on, I don't know, eating oranges. <laughs> it's a bad example, but just go with it. Um, and your orange consumers are like two different groups. One maybe is like children ages five to 15. And the other one is elderly folks, I don't know, 60 to 90. Um, you could in theory take that piece and ask generative AI to rewrite it or customize it to include specific benefits of eating oranges to those individual consumer groups. Because you're not really relying on it to create high quality content, you already did that. You're just asking it to repurpose it to a specific use case or individual. And I um, have to share, I just did this the other day. I had an email that I wanted to go out. Um, I got it to a specific level of quality and then I went to chat GPT to customize it to our customers. and. All it did was it added all the proverbial kind of like as a customer, thank you for your business, et cetera. Um, and that was helpful just because it helped cut a little bit of time from what I needed to do. So um, similarly, our customers kind of said the same thing. Content personalization is a great use case. About 94% say personalization has high potential. Um, as long as you keep in mind that personalization isn't that raw net new content generation you still have to have the tenants or foundation of your messaging in place um, in order to help the AI personalize it in a realistic way. I like to think of it like it's a valuable resource if you feed it a run book for it to follow. At least that's been my experience. Perfect, and then Katie, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Mariah. I think that you can write um, a, a solid piece of sort of generalized content. And then what you can do is say that you want to personalize it to the finance vertical or per personalize it to the healthcare vertical. If you likely already have a lot of that research about those personas, what you can do is you can paste the copy and then you can say, please essentially like add in points that address X, Y, and Z thing, or here's some data that we have about pain points that people in healthcare experience. Can you please add these into the existing copy? And in that way, you can really start to get a little bit more personal with say, whatever your core verticals are, be their finance, healthcare, gaming, whatever, um, because you've already done the work to understand the vertical, and then you've already done the work to create that initial sort of foundational piece of messaging. Um, I think the one thing that I do want to call out to be very careful about um, is making sure that your the content you are creating in chat GPT or any other sort of generative content platform um, is you're not feeding it any sort of proprietary information because once you put in something that is not supposed to be seen by 
the whole world, we don't really have those regulations in place at the moment to ensure that that data is going to be safe. Um, so when you're creating content or when you're creating vertical specific content, um, just make sure that it really is that sort of high level top of funnel stuff and that you're not getting too in the weeds about maybe classified product information or whatever else there may be that you don't necessarily want everyone to be able to get their hands on. Perfect. So then let's stem off of that a little bit and discuss um, what do you think are some of the other disadvantages or advantages of using AI generated content for both production and distribution? And again, Mariah, I'm going to throw this one to you to start. I think Katie got it right on. Um, and I think a few additional ones I kind of alluded to or mentioned earlier on, we still have to be really considerate of how we use it because First of all, there's still come some concerns on the quality of content and outputs. Um, and also, can we use that content in any digital marketing channels that interface with SEO because there's some potential negative effect there? We're still learning, right? Um, so for us, some of our biggest um, considerations are quality and SEO impact. Um, but we, similar to what Katie is mentioning, have also started to have conversation on its impact to privacy and security. There isn't really a playbook yet on how our team should and shouldn't use it. So there's always that risk that we're going to prompt it with something that is proprietary or confidential. I mean, keep in mind, in order to have an output, these things need an input. So like everything that we put into different generative AI tools, it's using to improve the model. And so, um, you know, don't get me wrong, I don't think most of us reasonable people are putting in like PII, um, personally identifiable information, like social security numbers, right? I, I hope we're smarter than that. But for example, like if you're a marketer, you need help with a new product launch. Maybe the product is not GA yet. Is there actually a negative impact to putting that into a generative AI tool to help you write quality content around a release? if the release isn't out yet. That's proprietary technology, right? So what's that impact look like? These are kind of the things that we're actively having conversations around with our customers. Um, and similarly, when we surveyed them, same kind of like top three considerations on concerns. Quality of content, definitely number one concern, followed by data security. Um, and third on the list is another one that's interesting that we haven't brought up in the context of this conversation yet, but I wanna comment on, is just concerns over biases or ethics or discrimination. Um, and this is where, you know, the material available to it on the web in itself maybe has questionable ethics or uh, implicit biases, that it then uses that to generate content. So I, I'll give an example, it's not a perfect example, but I remember, Many years ago, we were testing out an AI for BDR. So the AI would basically run the email sequences pretending to be a BDR. Um, and the AI did not pick up on sentiment or temperament. And I remember we had this prospect who was clearly sending back a negative response. And yet that AI kept reaching out. So I can only imagine how this problem would scale in situations where, again, the inputs the AI has have their own biases or kind of cloudy ethics. So it's something we have to pay close attention to. All right, awesome. And then um, Katie, do you have any other challenges, advantages you'd like to discuss? I mean, I completely agree with everything Mariah said. Um, I do think that there have definitely been times where I have written something from scratch myself and then also given sort of the prompt to ChatGPT. And ChatGPT will always turn out something that is grammatically correct that you know for the most part hits the right notes but it's not always the best way that a thing could be written or the most engaging way that it could be phrased um so i think just being aware that when you start from scratch it's not going to be the best content that you could get and that's not to say that it won't evolve and iterate and that there aren't ways to sort of start from scratch with a, a content creation system like that and get it to a good place but quality is definitely something that I have been very wary of and that has stopped me from using chat GPT for a lot of different things. Um, additionally, I mean, obviously all the proprietary data stuff that we sort of already hit on, um, there is 
some, and this is not to say that this is going to become a legal issue, but there is some murkiness around what chat GPT and systems like it are using when they scrape the web. Um, you think about privacy regulations like GDPR, like CCPA, um, and there is potential that some of the data that they scrape is in violation of some of those regulations. So therefore, if you are using a system like that to create content, will there ever be a situation where someone gets in trouble for using a generative AI content platform because of the fact that that platform scraped data that it shouldn't have scraped? I don't know, but I definitely think it is something to be aware of um, when you're defining your strategy and deciding how much you want to use something like ChatGPT versus just using writers. So it's very much a proceed with caution type of thing. Yes. It has pieces, but treat it as more of a first draft than anything else. Yes. And it's also, it's so new, right? Like this is, this is such a new technology, not the technology itself, but this widespread use of it is very new. So it's going to take a while for, uh, you know, historically very slow moving regulatory bodies to sort of catch up and figure out what the right thing is to do. Absolutely. So then in the report, it had mentioned that participants see promise in using AI for promoting content. So what are some of the ideas that you have for how to distribute or syndicate AI generated content? And uh, this time, Katie, we're going to start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it very much depends on what you're using it for, right? I think that um, that you can use for me, the way that I have been using AI generated content is for a lot of like ideation purposes, right? So if I'm doing a marketing campaign and I'm trying to figure out quippy taglines or trying to figure out like buckets to put things into, sometimes I'll go back and forth with chat GPT and sort of like the way that I would brainstorm with a coworker, right? Um, and so that isn't really something that I'm going to be distributing or syndicating so much as it is going to be something that gets infused into the overall strategy. Um, I do think you have to be very careful, um, sort of what Mariah said earlier in terms of creating SEO and getting into some like murky waters in terms of like what will be accepted in search engines versus what will not. Um, for traditional content syndication, though, if you're just thinking about working with a publication or something like that, um, you need to also be careful and make sure that they are comfortable with AI generated content. If they are, that's great. If you're not trying to use it for SEO purposes, if you're just trying to use it for thought leadership, syndicating through different publications, whatever can actually be a, a pretty good way to go. However, you do wanna make sure that you're gonna clear that with the publication because if they're gonna put it up on their website, they need to understand the type of content that they are getting. Um, and again, you don't wanna get yourself in trouble. You don't wanna get the company in trouble. But I do think that there, for thought leadership pieces, especially with some human oversight, there can be a really good potential fit there. All right, perfect. Then Mariah, anything else to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to second something Katie said too earlier about um, like testing. I think we've said like testing or piloting a bunch of times, not just proceed with caution, but also like try things. I think we're all at the stage of investigation. So take a piece that you've already written, put it in there and put prompts in there for a similar thing and see kind of the A-B test of it. But as far as the topic of promotion itself, um, something I've always said about content is like um, that feel the dreams uh, quote, but wrong, build it and they will not come kind of thing. Uh, because creating a quality piece of material in any form, it's really just the first step. So assuming you wrote your piece with a pers specific persona in mind, then you need to understand, you know, who are you promoting to create that database of contacts that match your ideal customer profile, use various channels and techniques to reach that ideal contact content with the piece that you've generated. Um, and then of course, give them kind of enough of a reason to download it. It's that cycle that every marketer goes through. Um, and this is kind of primarily where you also see traditional marketing automation platforms come in. So assuming for a minute you generated and iterated on a piece of content, using the support of generative AI, you still have to go through all the steps, right? 
which brings us to the same kind of common challenges that marketers are experiencing around once they have content, how do you get a quality download? Um, and a lot of the customers that we speak to primarily use um, certain channels. You know, they use email, they use social, they use webinar channels, all of those for content pr promotion, but they also use third party vendors for help. And in most cases, that's because, you know, their databases are finite. So that's kind of where a company like VIB comes in and where we work with our clients. We have one of the larger communities of tech influencers and buyers in our database. So what our customers will do is they'll leverage us to syndicate their content to their target audience in our community. So we basically just help them amplify their content outside of their node network. Um, but you know, it's one thing to get more downloads, but it's another thing completely to actually get downloads that then convert into a lead and then a meeting and then an opportunity and then revenue, right? That's a whole other animal. And that's kind of where we happen to thrive. So my biggest suggestion is once you leverage AI to generate that piece that you're proud of, definitely leverage the heck out of your internal channels, but then also consider looking for partners to help maximize your reach. All right, awesome. So then just pulling the lens back in general, how do you think businesses can use AI to improve their lead gen? Yeah, sure. Another question that um, like has a lot of different answers depending on where you start with this. I think um, for some of the use of AI for lead gen, for us, um, you know, some of it's already in full swing. And for many of you, you might be using a lot of AI already. For example, chatbots, right? Chatbots have made that live interactive qualification a little bit more streamlined for those of us that use it. Um, also, not necessarily like AI per se, but automation of email campaigns. That's helped us immensely bring people through the touch points of that buyer's journey and has definitely helped accelerate and improve lead gen. Um, and I, I think one of the things we mentioned earlier too in the world of generative AI that can help in lead gen is that personalization aspect. If we can speak to the differences in our individual buying groups more exclusively without needing to do a ton of work to build it and to personalize it to all those different groups that could help us improve our conversions. I know like for me, I'm more likely to engage with a vendor if I believe that they know something about me and are speaking kind of to my individual needs. Um, and lastly, at VIB, we're also using AI to help accelerate our time to meetings too. Um, we have a tool that we proactively uh, use and it puts a meeting in somebody's calendar and does kind of the back and forth negotiation on kind of the day and time confirmation um, on behalf of us. And that's also helped a lot. It's helped improve our conversions because it's kind of taking away all that human lag and behavior around the back and forth of getting a time scheduled. So. Um, there's a lot of applications for AI for lead gen. I, I would say maybe one last one. Um, many of you may already be using AI can be great to analyze patterns and behaviors. Um, in some cases, it can potentially even predict buying behaviors. So if you have an ABM program and you use intent platforms with some kind of predictive scoring, you're already using AI for lead gen. So lots of nuances to it, but just a few examples of how companies can use AI for lead gen. Okay, perfect. And then, um, Katie, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, the biggest thing, actually, I think for me is that predictive behavioral analytics piece, right? Being able to say, like, okay, so people who come in through this channel uh, from this type of campaign are X times more likely to be a repeat customer. That sort of information I think is invaluable. Um, but when we're talking specifically about generative AI, you know, like say you have a, an email sequence or like an outreach sequence that is a super high converting sequence and it's a very generalized, you know, stream of five emails or whatever it may be. Um, if you can take that and then create different versions for different types of buyers, for different buyer personas, you are able to take something that's already working really well and tailor it to 
very specific types of people, very specific buyers. And in doing that, the thing that was working really well is now going to work exceptionally because it's not just that general messaging. It is that really specific, I know what it is that keeps you up at night type of outreach that I think is just, it's always going to land better no matter what. Um, and instead of having to sit down and be like, all right, now I'm going to take these five emails and I'm going to write it for finance. And now I'm going to take these five emails and now I'm going to write it for healthcare. And now I'm going to write it for retail. And now I'm going to write it for whatever else it may be to just be able to pop that in to some type of platform and have that platform spit it back out in, you know, 30 seconds or less, I think is a huge time saver. Um, and the, the amount of energy that you have to put in versus what the potential is to get out of it is just, it's night and day. All right, awesome. So unfortunately, we are coming up on time. Um, so Mariah, do you want to quickly wrap us up here? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And um, I would, again, just double down on what Katie said, which is if you think about generative AI as something that can be a time saver for pre-existing information and iterate, iterate on it um, with some caution on what you're using it for, it can be such a gain as far as efficiency is concerned. I also wanted to just share that the results that I shared on screen today, they're part of a marketing trends report for 2023 that we created. So as an attendee to this session, we will be sending you the complete report. So definitely look out for that. And I also wanted to share that if you are interested in some of the things I mentioned on what VIB does for our clients, um, we do have trials available. So I just invite you to try us out for yourself. Um, specifically because we talked a little bit about content syndication today. If you have a piece of content that you'd like to amplify, you can try this content syndication trial where we'll basically syndicate one of your assets and deliver you 25 downloads just so that you can test it out because we believe what we can deliver. But there's also some trials for um, our email service and also our um, sales appointment setting service too. So you can go ahead and scan the QR code or grab the link above the screenshot on the screen if you're interested. Otherwise, thank you and back to you, Kelly. All right, awesome. Thank you both again for that presentation. It was so perfect.